Hello and welcome to ABC News. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. There are now more than 4,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus in Australia. There is a trend downwards in the number of new daily cases. Bulk build telehealth conferences to go live for appointments with doctors and other health professionals. And volunteer doctors and nurses on a mercy flight to northern Italy, the area worst hit by the virus. Hello and welcome to ABC News. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. There are now more than 4,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus in Australia. But there is a trend downwards in the number of new daily cases. Authorities say there are early signs that the measures aimed at limiting the spread are working. These are the latest developments on the coronavirus pandemic. The government's expected to unveil a new wage subsidy for businesses and workers affected by the coronavirus crisis. It's understood businesses will be paid up to $1,500 a fortnight per employee for the next six months. Tasmania has recorded its first death from coronavirus. The Premier confirmed a woman in her 80s died in the North West Regional Hospital this morning. Three crew members from the Ruby Princess cruise ship are now being treated at a hospital in Sydney. The ship is now anchored off Botany Bay and was at the centre of a controversy after passengers were allowed to disembark despite several COVID-19 tests pending. Health authorities in New South Wales, meanwhile, have confirmed 127 new coronavirus cases, taking the state's total to 1,918, almost half the national total, which is around 4,000. There's hope the numbers of new cases in the state are stabilising. So far, the virus has claimed 17 lives in Australia. America's leading expert on coronavirus is predicting the pandemic could kill between 100,000 and 200,000 in the people in the US alone. The head of the US task force has serious concerns about the rates of infection in New York, New Orleans and Detroit. And the UNHCR is worried about the rate of infection in Turkey. There are currently more than 4 million refugees there and travel data suggests Thousands of people fleeing the worsening situation in Iran flew to Istanbul just last month. The government's preparing to unveil a new JobKeeper wage subsidy scheme that's designed to help businesses keep their staff employed during this coronavirus crisis. The announcement is expected later today. For more on this, Noor Haider joins us from Parliament House. Noor, what do we know so far about this wage subsidy plan that's to come? Well, Jeremy, the government is expected to announce this wage subsidy scheme, which is expected to see uh, employers get $1,500 a fortnight per employee for the next six months. Now, unions and the opposition have been calling for a similar measure ever since the government in the UK announced that it would cover the, up to 80% of a worker's wage. Now, the uh, it's understood that payments will be backdated. That could potentially see uh, tens of thousands of Australians who have recently found themselves stood down from their jobs, assisted in some way. Uh, the details of this scheme are yet to be fully revealed. The Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, says the aim is to have businesses, uh, I guess, stay open, even, even though they may temporarily have their doors shut during this crisis. He wants employees to stay attached to their employers. Take a listen. Uh, what we have always sought to do is to get Australians to the other side of this crisis, recognising how extraordinary it is and that we're facing two wars uh, on uh, uh, two wars at the same time, a health crisis and an economic crisis. And so the announcement today is all about providing additional income support and keeping employees connected to their employer, because once we get to the other side of this, we want the recovery to be as speedy uh, um, as possible. Josh Frydenberg there. Now, Nor something a lot of people have been calling, about, calling for for the last few weeks, the eviction of residential and commercial tenants in financial strife will be temporarily banned now. How is that going to work? 
while Jeremy states and territories will be moving to put a temporary six-month ban on evictions, both for residential and commercial tenants who can no longer afford their rent. So details, again, of this scheme remain scarce, but the federal government is expected to reveal more in the coming days. We heard from the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, yesterday, and he essentially said in the meantime he's urging tenants and landlords to get together and to negotiate. He also wants banks to help out during these circumstances. Of course, unprecedented amounts of uh, Australians have found themselves uh, without a job in, a, in rather rapid circumstances. So uh, this will form part of the government's third economic assistance package, which is expected to be unveiled in the coming days. But the Prime Minister essentially says that he wants to be able to uh, hibernate businesses during this stage, uh, during the next six months as, you know, more social restrictions come into effect. Take a listen to the Prime Minister describing how this hibernation plan will work. This is part of the hibernation approach where we want people bespoke, customised to their own circumstances to sit down and work these things out. There's no rule book for this. We are in uncharted territory, but the goal should be shared and that is a business that can reopen on the other side, not weighed down by excessive debts because of rental arrears. A landlord that has a tenant so they can continue into the future to be able to support the investments that they have made. Scott Morrison there, and nor social gathering restrictions have been also tightened. Take us through what the latest advice means in practice. Well, yesterday the National Cabinet agreed to limit uh, social gatherings to a maximum of two people. Now, this won't apply to people uh, of the same household or of the same family. So, uh, for example, a family of five could still go out for a walk together uh, outdoors. But it also doesn't apply uh, in wet for weddings or funerals. So we know that the pre-existing rules uh, of a cap of five people at weddings and maximum of ten people at funerals uh, remains in place. The Prime Minister also yesterday said that states and territories would be able to enforce this rule. We already have heard from Victoria and New South Wales saying that they will be uh, imposing fines or penalties for people found to be breaching this two-person maximum limit. Now, in addition to that, all Australians are being urged simply not to leave the house unless it's absolutely necessary to do so. So what does that mean? That means only if you need to go and buy essential uh, food items, if you need medical care or if you're going to work or if you're going outside to get some fresh air. Besides that, Australians are being told to stay put and to stay indoors. Uh, outside gyms, playgrounds and skate parks will all be shut down as of today. And Australians who are considered to be the most vulnerable, those are people aged over 70, are really being urged to stay in self-isolation and to limit social contact. For Indigenous Australians, that's for anyone over the age of 50. And the federal government is urging everyone to abide by these guidelines. Nor Hader reporting from Parliament House in Canberra. Nor thank you. Tasmania, meanwhile, has recorded its first death from the coronavirus crisis, taking the national toll to 17. Reporter Laura Beavis is in Hobart. Laura, what do we know about this latest casualty? Yes, Jeremy. Unfortunately, we learned this morning that a woman aged in her 80s died in the Northwest Regional Hospital in Burnie on Tasmania's northwest coast this morning. This woman had been in hospital for several days fighting off the effects of the virus. We understand she must have contracted the infection either directly or indirectly from overseas travel or people being on cruise ships. Premier Peter Gutwin said this morning he was deeply saddened to learn of this lady's death. However, he believes that there will be further deaths in Tasmania. And he said this really shows how important it is to follow the rules. Here's what he had to say. Every single Tasmanian now has the tools available to them. Social distancing makes certain that you abide by the rules. You know, what we should all agree as Tasmanians is that we are going to stand up and do every single possible thing that we can to suppress this disease, to ensure that we flatten the curve. You know, that's the one thing that we can all do. And it gives me absolutely no pleasure at all to introduce those measures that will be in place from midnight tonight. And what I would say to Tasmanians is do everything that you can to abide by them. Do your bit for yourself, for your family, for your community. 
You know, let's stand up together as Tasmanians and take the opportunity to fight this. So, Laura, what's the latest on the number of cases of infection in Tasmania? Well, right now there are 66 diagnosed cases of coronavirus in Tasmania. This lady who sadly died was one of those. Yesterday we had four new cases diagnosed. Of those people, three had been on the Ovation of the Seas cruise liner and one on the Voyager of the Seas cruise. Those people, because they'd been on the cruises, had already been sent into self-isolation, so they were already quarantining themselves when they were diagnosed. The vast majority of cases in Tasmania are directly or indirectly linked to either overseas travel or people on cruise ships. However, there are two cases in the state's northwest in the Devonport area where a source for their infection cannot be found. One of those is a health worker who worked in the emergency department of the Mersey Community Hospital. There's a really uh, extensive public health investigation happening at the moment to try to find out how those people contracted coronavirus because there are fears that could represent community transmission in Tasmania. So far the source is unknown but about 22 people who were close contacts of those two cases had been sent into self-isolation. Laura, how is Tasmania enforcing new arrival and public gathering restrictions? Well, Tasmania has added to its already strict uh, border control policies at the moment. So people flying into Tasmania, coming in via the Spirit of Tasmania ferries, are being met at the ports, taken to hotels by police and supervised there by police and ADF personnel for 14 days of self-isolation. Now that's on top of any self-isolation they've already done on the mainland if they've come into Australia from overseas. So Tasmanians coming back from international destinations are facing a month of quarantine at the moment. You also heard uh, Premier Peter Gutwin earlier saying that uh, from midnight tonight, the Tasmanian government will be enforcing the new public gathering rules that limit public gatherings to a maximum of two people. They're considering on the spot fines but we do know that the maximum penalty that the government will be mandating is up to $16,000 for a fine or six months in prison. And the Premier says police won't hesitate to levy those against people if they're flouting the laws. The Premier has indicated there could be further restrictions introduced if needed, but at the moment he's really resisting a full lockdown just because of how even more destructive that would be for the Tasmanian economy. Laura Beavis reporting from Hobart. Thank you. So let's move northwards to the outbreak in New South Wales and Victoria. Rani Heyman is in Sydney and Richard Robertson is in Melbourne. Rani, first to you. Returning travellers have spent their first night in quarantine in hotels with more arrivals expected today headed for the same fate. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, we've had a number of people already begin to arrive at Sydney International Airport and as you can see behind me, uh, there is a bit of a presence here at the Intercontinental Hotel in Sydney where about three buses have turned up and we've had some passengers disembark from those buses um, and these are obviously international arrivals that have come here this morning. They will spend the next two weeks in quarantine here at this hotel and others will spend quarantine in other hotels across Sydney um, as they wait out this time that they have to spend in isolation. But yesterday we spoke to a number of people who said that they were a little bit frustrated with the process of how things have unfolded when they've uh, stepped off the plane and come onto these buses. Some of them said that they were on the buses for about three hours yesterday, so quite a long time um, as officials tried to figure out where they were going. But obviously this is a measure that was implemented from Sunday, so it's still quite early um, and I guess there probably is a bit of confusion as to how things are panning out. Uh, Rani, what about the cases of new infections in New South Wales? It seems that the rate has been moderating somewhat. That's right, we heard from the New South Wales Chief uh, Medical Officer, Dr Cher uh, Kerry Chant, earlier today, and she said that while the number of cases um, aren't sort of heavily increasing, um, we do now know that we have over, uh, we've got one, over 1,900 confirmed cases of coronavirus in New South Wales. Um, and as you know, we've tragically seen eight people die from this virus uh, in March. So at the moment, um, we have heard also recently that there were three crew members who were on board the Ruby Princess cruise ship that was docked 
uh, offshore from Sydney. Um, they were evacuated from that cruise ship overnight and brought into Sydney um, where they're receiving medical treatment. Now, we don't know exactly what they're being treated for, um, but what we do know is that there, there was around 100, uh, sorry, 1,100 crews still on board that cruise ship uh, out to sea for the last two weeks, but uh, two weeks ago, 2,700 people, uh, passengers and crew, disembarked in Sydney, uh, and that was even while people were awaiting the results of coronavirus uh, tests. And since then, we've seen several hundred people uh, test positive for, for coronavirus from that cruise, and we've tragically seen one woman in her 70s die. Rani Heyman in Sydney. Let's take you across to Melbourne now uh, with uh, Bridget Rollison. Bridget, uh, bring us up to date with the latest in Victoria. Sure, well, there's been 56 new cases of coronavirus in Victoria overnight, bringing the state's total to 821. The state's death toll remains at four, and the four people who have died are all men aged in their 70s and 80s. Victoria currently has 29 people in hospital with the virus, and four of those are in intensive care. But the Victorian Premier, Daniel Andrews, really used his press conference this morning to beg Victorians to stay at home. He made it very clear that there are only four reasons why you need to leave the house, and that's to get food and supplies uh, for medical care or for exercise or to go to work if you are deemed an essential worker. But he used some pretty strong language saying, unless you want to bury your best mate or an elderly relative, then you really need to stay at home. If everyone follows these rules, and they are as simple as they can be, then uh, we will slow the spread of this virus, we will save lives, we will protect our health system, we will get through this together and we will get to the other side of it quicker. That's the key message today. Stay at home. Officer Brett Sutton vented his frustration with people over the weekend not doing the right thing. What did he have to say to them? Yeah, so he said he was uh, very frustrated with the crap behaviour, is what he called it, on the weekend of uh, hundreds of people driving down to the beach on the weekend and congregating there in Victoria. Um, he said he's still been seeing some of that frustrating behaviour and says uh, people really need to do the right thing because it's a matter of life or death. But he says now really is the time to do the right thing while we still have a relatively low number of cases. And he said that in Australia we could uh, cap cases at 10 to 15,000 if we just all do the right thing now. And he says if we don't, we could be seeing hundreds of thousands of new cases each day. Bridget Rollison in Melbourne, Rani Heyman in Sydney. Thank you to both. Well, a cluster of infections in South Australia's Barossa Valley wine region is causing concern to health authorities. Our reporter Brittany Evans is there. Brittany, take us through what uh, this cluster is about. Look, Jeremy, at the moment in the Barossa region, we've actually had a lockdown of schools. So here this morning, schools and kindergartens have shut. And this is the first, play, uh, the first time this has happened in South Australia and the only region so far that has uh, taken this drastic measure. But yeah, as you say, it's due to this cluster of 34 people. SA Health say that these people um, are likely to have come in contact with two groups of travellers. They're the travellers we've been hearing about for the past couple of weeks from America and a group from Switzerland as well so they believe that these uh, this cluster of people of 34 people in the Barossa uh, have been contracted coronavirus due to uh, coming in contact with these travellers. Now the Barossa Valley itself is quite a small regional town it's um, it got a number of regional towns inside the Barossa Valley but the ones that are affected include Tanunda, Williamstown, Anguston, Lindock and Nuriupta. So many people here uh, locally are being told to reduce their movements. So locals here should stay indoors and stay home unless they really, really need to go out. But in terms of non-essential travel, people really shouldn't be coming to the region and are being advised to stay away, in particular uh, those international travellers and, uh, well, travellers in general. Uh, the Barossa itself is very reliant on tourists, uh, but at the moment, obviously, many businesses suffering from that. And how are people feeling about these restrictions? 
Yeah, we've been out this morning speaking with a few locals and spoke with the mayor who said many people in the region are understandably scared and worried about what it could mean. Obviously, with the closure of schools and kindies, it means that many parents now may have to stay home even if they are deemed an essential service and are needing to go to work. So the mayor said many people are already struggling with that so far. And as you can understand, the businesses here being reliant on tourists, it's a very hard change and, and a big change for many people in the community. So people are worried, but also speaking to the businesses, they say that they will get through this. They say, although at the moment things are tough, the Barossa is a very strong community and in the long term, this won't uh, impact them. Brittany Evans reporting from the Barossa Valley in South Australia. Let's take you overseas now. And the US President Donald Trump has extended physical isolation guidelines until the end of April. The president has repeatedly expressed the hope he'd be able to reopen the US economy by Easter. He says the death rate is likely to peak in two weeks. The US has over 130,000 cases of COVID-19, more than in any other country in the world. President Trump is urging all Americans to follow these guidelines. The better you do, the faster this whole nightmare will end. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. We can expect that by June 1st, we will be well on our way to recovery. We think by June 1st, a lot of great things will be happening. I want every citizen in our country to take heart and confidence in the fact that we have the best medical minds in the world tackling this disease. We have the best science, the best researchers, and the best talent anywhere working night and day to protect your family and loved ones and to overcome this pandemic. Meanwhile, the head of Italy's coronavirus response team says there's a severe shortage of medical staff in the north of the country, the area worst hit by the pandemic. Doctors and nurses from across the country are being asked to volunteer to work there. There have now been more than 97,000 confirmed infections and 10,000 COVID-19 deaths in Italy. They've come from around the world to serve on the front line of this crisis. Doctors from Russia, Cuba and now Albania, and from every corner of Italy too. I just finished from the hospital after 12 hours. I'm so tired. <laughs> Giuseppe's never worked in an emergency room. He only qualified last year. But he's left his home in Sicily for a field hospital at the epicentre. Why did you decide to travel to work up here? The emergency was here, and it's still here. And so I'm here to get my contribution, my little contribution, um, and help my colleagues. The force at which this virus struck the north of Italy has left it exposed. 300 doctors were flown in from different parts of the country last week, but this wasn't nearly enough. The situation in the north is so acute, so many doctors and nurses have fallen sick now that the government is appealing to people from all over the country to travel up there and help. The north is still in a deep crisis. We have a shortage of uh, specialised people in the health sector because they have been uh, contaminated. And so, of course, more of them now are observing a quarantine period. With 4,000 nurses now infected, Hundreds more are being drafted in over the next two days. Ah. Simona is one of them. E mi aspetto che ci sia tanta sofferenza e tanto bisogno di supporto e sia morale che professionale da parte dei pazienti che da parte del personale sanitario che è messo a dura prova. The hospital is full and so crowded. All the people was hit by that, that virus like a train, like a tornado. It's terrible. Tonight there's been an improvement. The rate of new infections and deaths are slightly down. But make no mistake, this country is still in crisis with a long, hard fight ahead. G. McKenzie. Well, the death toll in Spain has risen by more than 800 cases to 6,528, second only to Italy. Madrid's regional government has announced an official period of mourning for those who've died, while nationwide infections rose to more than 78,000 cases. 
The Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, has announced that all non-essential workers must stay at home for two weeks. Schools, bars, restaurants and shops selling non-essential items have been shut since March the 14th and most of the population is now housebound. Across the world, health systems are struggling to meet the demand of COVID-19 patients. The situation is compounded in countries where the health system is already struggling without a pandemic. The Pacific island of Guam, a US territory, has recorded just over 50 cases of COVID-19 and officials have warned that the hospital system could reach breaking point this week. Australia's Prime Minister has told world leaders that countries throughout the Pacific region will require international support in the face of coronavirus. Our reporter Natalie Whiting joins us now from Brisbane. Natalie, how many cases of COVID-19 have been recorded now in the Pacific? Well, Jeremy, they've just hit over 100, uh, 114 confirmed cases across the Pacific region. Uh, mainly they're in Guam, as you mentioned, uh, New Caledonia and French Polynesia also have a majority, but we've also seen cases being recorded in Fiji, Papua New Guinea and uh, the Northern Marianas. Uh, so, but as you mentioned, Guam really is the main area of concern for the Pacific at the moment. It's recorded just over half of all the COVID-19 cases. And, and what is the situation in Guam? What is their particular concern about the number of cases they have right now? Yes, 56 may not seem like a lot when you're hearing countries recording thousands of cases, but Guam's a very small island. Uh, it only has one hospital. The chief medical officer uh, said that there's 250 staffed hospital beds uh, and only 13 staffed intensive care beds. So he's already warned uh, that Guam could reach a uh, break point for its critical health care uh, this week. So for how many people are there and the resources they have, uh, there are real concerns. And it's not just local transmission that Guam has to contend with. Uh, a US aircraft carrier uh, has actually been docked there it uh, recorded an outbreak of COVID-19 while out at sea. So it's now docked at Guam and there are 5,000 people on board uh, that Navy ship that are also being tested. Uh, what about other uh, Pacific countries, Natalie? How are they responding to this imminent crisis on their doorstep? Well, there's been pretty wide acceptance uh, and honesty about the fact that a lot of these Pacific Island countries their health systems cannot respond to a pandemic. These health systems are already struggling at the best of times, let alone with a pandemic. So we're seeing nations across this region taking uh, quite extreme measures very early to try to stop it before it spreads. Papua New Guinea recorded one case, a fly-in, fly-out mine worker from Australia. Uh, that mine worker has since been returned here to Australia. But in response to just that one case, they've implemented a two-week state of emergency. Uh, they've stopped international travel. They've grounded domestic flights. Uh, so in response to one case, they've gone into lockdown. And we're seeing several other Pacific Island countries, including uh, Tonga, uh, Vanuatu, uh, the Solomon Islands, uh, Samoa, taking extreme measures, extreme precautionary measures, such as lockdowns and implementing states of national emergencies before they even record a case. That's how vulnerable these countries are. Australia is the closest friend to some of these nations. The Prime Minister has acknowledged that this region will need support. What help is Australia providing? That's right. Uh, on the back of that uh, emergency leaders summit of the G20, uh, the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison uh, said that he told international leaders that the, the Pacific region was going to need support and need international help in the face of, of COVID-19. Uh, Australia has been providing some expertise and, um, and some medical supplies. Uh, Mr Morrison has said that aid will be reconfigured in the region uh, to help address COVID-19 and to ensure that health systems can keep functioning. Uh, Papua New Guinea, their government has already said that more than 20 million Australian dollars uh, from the existing aid budget is going to be redistributed to respond to this coronavirus. Uh, so they're going to need more help. They're going to need uh, more help from more countries. China's also stepping up in some areas. So it's going to be uh, interesting to, to watch and see what countries can provide what help as we go forward. Natalie Whiting, our correspondent, uh, live from Brisbane. Thank you so much, Natalie.
Let's turn to finance news now with Sue Lennon. Sue, the banks are giving more companies a bit more time, some breathing space on their repayments. Yeah, loans. that's right. They've expanded this uh, loan repayment holiday, which was announced by the Australian Banking Association about a week or so ago. Of course, they had been in discussions with the federal government and part of the quid pro quo, pro quo is for the banks to also help the community. Obviously, if... Low, uh, borrowers go under. That is also really big, bad for the bank's business. So they've expanded the amount of loan that a small business or a, now a big business can uh, defer their loan repayments for up to six months. So originally it was $3 million. Now it's gone up to $10 million. And the Australian Banking Association says that covers about 98% of business loans. Now one more media organisation described it as billions, a multi-billion dollar bailout of corporate Australia. I guess, yes, you can look at it this way, but um, as everyone, as the government's been saying, everyone uh, will feel the pain and everyone needs to cop a haircut and this could be the only way for some businesses to stay open. And it's not as if they don't have to pay that money back. That just gets kicked down the road further down, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. And this is a big issue. The banks note that in their fine small print that interest capitalisation will still apply, which means that uh, borrowers, so not just business borrowers, but mortgage borrowers as well that have got uh, a repayment holiday, they, it will actually increase their loan because you're not, pay, you're not paying your repayments, but the interest is still accruing on your loan and also the fees and charges that you pay is still accruing. So in the end, the value of your, the money that you owe will go up. So certainly it's going to be very hard for some people and some businesses, some home loan borrowers and some businesses to repay their loans because who knows if they've lost their job or their businesses had to close because of the ban on non-essential businesses, who knows when they're going to get money through the door. Even though they're not paying, they may have now a rent holiday. That's another important point, Jeremy, that I didn't mention. The, for the commercial landlords, they're... Uh, they're their approval for a home loan, oh, sorry, a loan repayment holiday is contingent on them giving their tenants a break, so not so you've a victim. So pay it them. forward. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So now, it's hard for everyone. Now, speaking of uh, home loans, we've just coming off the weekend, a key time for selling in a lot of the auction markets around the country, and perhaps unsurprisingly a big fall in clearance rates. Yeah, not as bad as it could have been, but, yeah, the preliminary uh, clearance rate, according to CoreLogic, has gone down to about 51%. So two weeks ago, it was, uh, I think it was about 70 or 80% because, of course, home prices have reached new record highs in some cities because of record low interest rates. But now, again, because of the ban on non-essential businesses, you can't have home inspections, you can't have auctions in person. It's all gone virtual. Not surprisingly, that has really dented the appetite for buying homes. But also what happened, Jeremy, is a lot of people that were trying to sell their homes, they pulled them out of the market. About 40% of the 300,000 or so homes that were meant to go to auction this past weekend were actually pulled out. So it just shows that firstly, buyers are really cautious and obviously homeowners are really cautious and in a sense these moves by the federal government kind of put a freeze on the property market so there's a real disincentive for people to sell and there's a bit of a disincentive to buy if you can't go and do an inspection so I guess that's sort of in a way it prevents a mass panic sell-off which would really hurt property prices at a time when obviously if prices slump, if people lose their jobs then prices will slump and there's a real risk of a housing market crash. Now, amid all this doom and gloom, the share market is higher today. Explain that one for us. Well, this is a bear market. So even though there's been rallies here and there, we saw a huge rally the other day on Wall Street. Actually, Dow Jones went into a bull market, believe that, 20% up in three or so days. But the reality is these are the hallmarks of a bear market, which is a market which is falling, where investors are very cautious and it's likely to fall further. So today is an up day. Uh, investors are a bit more optimistic today, probably, be, probably because there's all this money coming from the federal government and from banks. So let's have a quick look at the numbers. The ASX 200 at 
12.30 Australian Eastern Daylight Time, up 2%. And the All Ordinary is also up 2%. Most sectors on the ASX 200 are higher. And going high today, higher today is Ansel, the rubber gloves maker, up 16%. Asian markets, though, in the red. The Nikkei has taken a big hit today, down 726 points. The New Zealand market also weaker. We're just waiting for the opening numbers from the Hang Seng and the Shanghai market in China. Now, US stocks were sold off. The Dow Jones index lost 4%. That was as the number of coronavirus cases in North America topped 100,000 and it came despite con congressional approval of a $3.6 trillion economic rescue package. Now, commodities, no surprise. Investors turning to gold. So it has come off its highs but still well above $1,600 US dollars an ounce. And take a look at oil Obviously, a big slump in the price of oil because a big drop in demand because of the shutdown caused by the coronavirus. West Texas crew below 15 US dollars a barrel. Well, let's have a look at currencies. The Australian dollar buying around 61.3 US cents has been up and down today. But again, currency markets also experiencing a lot of volatility. Jeremy? Sue, thank you. Thank you. The top stories on ABC News. The government is preparing to unveil a new JobKeeper wage subsidy scheme designed to help businesses keep their staff employed during the crisis. It's understood businesses will be paid up to $1,500 a fortnight per employee for the next six months. The Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, says the scheme is designed to keep as many Australians in work as possible. Tasmania, meanwhile, has recorded its first death from the virus. A woman in her 80s was being treated for COVID-19 in the Northwest Regional Hospital. The Premier has told Tasmanians that people's lives were at risk and they need to take the situation seriously. Patients are now able to access bulk billed telehealth consultations with their doctors and many other health professionals, meaning they won't have to pay any out-of-pocket costs. It's part of a $1.1 billion government funding boost. Telehealth consultations are virtual appointments conducted over the phone or video conferencing facilities. And doctors and nurses have joined a mercy flight to northern Italy, the area worst hit by the coronavirus. Italy's health ministry says it expects to see a significant drop in cases within 10 days. There have been more than 10,000 coronavirus-related deaths in Italy. Now to take us through the latest coronavirus numbers, here's analyst Casey Briggs. We are tracking all the latest coronavirus figures from the globe and in Australia. Let's start locally, where uh, only a few states have updated their numbers today, but already Australia has now recorded more than 4,000 cases. New South Wales on 1,918. That state's seen an increase of 127 cases today. Now, that's actually a good thing. That's uh, the, the smallest increase New South Wales has recorded since last Sunday. That could mean these social distancing measures that we've been talking about uh, are working. What we don't yet know is if there's some level of local community transmission that hasn't been picked up by testing under the, uh, the former testing uh, rules that weren't looking for that. So we're waiting and seeing if that number continues to go down or if we'll start to see community transmission, which health authorities are so worried about. Victoria's also seen a smaller increase than it's seen in the past few days, 821 cases as of today. Queensland 656. We haven't yet seen an update from Queensland authorities yet. In terms of the deaths, Tasmania has now recorded its first Australian death in this pandemic. Across the country, 17 people have died. Let's look around the world as well. More than 722,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus around the world. Remember, the number of cases in each country is also driven by the amount of testing they do. So sometimes it's a bit hard to compare the numbers between countries. But of the confirmed cases, the US is on 142,000. That's almost a fifth of all the world's cases, while Italy just shy of 100,000. In terms of deaths, we're almost at 34,000 across the world now. Italy leading that leaderboard, unfortunately, 10,779. There's one country I do want to show you as well, though, and it's a bit further down the list, and it's Turkey. 9,217 cases so far, so considerably less than the ones uh, that, that are currently dealing with this uh, outbreak most acutely. But what's interesting is the uh, speed at which it's got to where it is. This is a selection of the countries around the world. This one's the US, 142,000, growing extremely steeply at the moment. Turkey, 
is all the way down here. Uh, what's concerning though is how fast they've got there and we can see that if we look at the trajectories. We've changed the scale of this graph and we've shifted all the countries so that their outbreaks start at the same point. You'd much rather be a country like Singapore with a slower growth than a country like the US with a steeper growth, but this is Turkey. Turkey has got to 9,217 cases before any other country in the world. It's got the steepest current trajectory. That is a really big concern about the outbreak in that country. Jeremy. Casey Briggs, thank you. Well, as we've been reporting, telehealth consultations go live today. I'm joined by our national medical reporter, Sophie Scott, to tell us more. Uh, Sophie, why is the government moving to telehealth? I guess it's pretty obvious. People congregating in waiting rooms was just not a good idea anymore. That's right. Look, it was just another risk, another way of people contracting the virus by sitting around in a crowded waiting room. Look, there's been some telehealth in Australia, but it's been on a very small scale. So this move to widespread telehealth is a massive step forward for patients in Australia. And it's, uh, it's fortuitous that it's just happened now. It's, uh, it's, the government described it as 10 years worth of work in a couple of days. So other countries around the world have actually been ahead of Australia with telehealth. Um, so this brings us in line with some other countries. What it is designed to do is to keep people out of waiting rooms, but also to protect doctors as well, because um, if patients are coming in, even though they can screen them on the telephone, still when they come in, they're not going to know whether they really have the virus or not. So the way that telehealth will work is that any patient uh, can ring a GP and a list of other specialists that we can go through. And you can either have a telephone call or you can do it via some of the video streaming platforms like Skype or FaceTime or WhatsApp. So even if you don't have those platforms, you can still just do it through a plain old telephone. It doesn't have to be anything technological, anything too fancy, which is important for particularly for older people who might want to use the service. So the way it would work is if you just ring up your GP or, and say, look, I want to come and see or want to talk to the doctor. They'll then ascertain whether it is the sort of consultation that would make sense to have via either over the phone or over a video platform. And if it is, then they'll just make a time that the doctor will call you back. Simple as that. Uh, Sophie, what are doctors saying about the efficacy of doing a consultation like this over a, 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 a phone or a, or a Skype session, for instance, when so much of those consultations involves them, you know, checking your temperature, looking down your throat, looking inside your ears? Well, look, for some consultations, it's not going to be appropriate. The, one of the great things about the way it can be used is for ongoing management of conditions that people have. Now, these days in Australia, a lot of people live with chronic conditions. So that's like diabetes or obesity or high blood pressure. And often, uh, particularly older people have the equipment at home. Like, for example, my father-in-law has a blood pressure machine at home. So he can actually take his own blood pressure. And often people with diabetes, they can measure their own blood sugar as well. So... Those chronic conditions can be managed um, over Skype or over a phone call. But obviously there are some conditions where the person needs to be in the doctor's waiting room and needs to be in the doctor's surgery. So it's really a way of just screening out those conditions where you can be uh, seen over the phone or over Skype versus those ones where you do need to be there. But again, it's just another really good way of keeping people out of a busy waiting room when you're surrounded by people who uh, might have, you know, not just necessarily coronavirus, but... It's also the cold and flu season as well. So you're keeping people out of that environment where they might just have a cold or flu or other virus that you don't necessarily want to pick up. The other reason that this is a really important move is there's, um, there's a real shortage of the what they call the personal protective equipment. So that's masks and gloves and gowns. And the, the fewer GPs and doctors that need to use that to see patients in real life the more that can be preserved when they really need it. And it's not just GPs. We can just go through the list. So it's psychologists, psychiatrists, nurses and midwives. It's um, pediatricians and the kids that have developmental delays. There's a whole raft of specialists that they can see. Also Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander practitioners and also social workers and dietitians who are treating people with eating disorders. So all those services will now be available via the phone or via a video streaming platform. So it is a really big step forward in terms of getting um, patient care out to those people who need it. It will obviously be very useful as well for regional and rural Australia. Um, even with a phone line, we don't necessarily need to have the internet to have a video call. A phone line will be just as useful for, for the majority of cases, not, not all cases, but again, it's just keeping people away from a busy doctor's waiting room where they might be uh, subject to 
all sorts of other colds and flus, let alone the uh, coronavirus. And Sophie, how much will this all cost? Look, that's a good question. Uh, I think it will depend on the, the take-up. You know, I know lots of GPs are very enthusiastic um, and really want their patients to take this up. And I would imagine for most patients as well will be happy to, uh, to, to use this service. It's certainly, particularly, for example, if you know that you're on, say, a medication and you just need to get a new script for it, it will save you having to go into a busy waiting room. As to how much it's going to cost, I think it will really depend on um, the, the take-up of this, this plan. I know that um, GPs are enthusiastic, patient groups are enthusiastic. Both the, um, the Australian Medical Association and the College of GPs have been calling for this. So they're very keen and their members will definitely get on board. Um, whether it might take a little while for some people to, to get used to it, but I think it's like, you know, Australians are very early adopters for technology. And I think once you've got the option of seeing or talking to your doctor via this platform, that we'll see lots of patients using it. Sophie Scott, our medical reporter, good to have you on the show again. Thank you. Mental health advocates have welcomed the announcement of $74 million to help with the strain on services caused by coronavirus. Patrick McGorry is Executive Director of Youth Mental Health Advocacy Group Origin. He joins us now from Melbourne. Uh, Patrick McGorry, good to have you with us again. Thanks, Jeremy. Hi. How much... Uh, I, I'd really love to get your, um, your measure on what's taking place around the country, around the world right now, in terms of mental health uh, coming from this crisis. Well, um, it, it's had a very profound effect. Um, obviously, everyone, every single person in the population probably is feeling a rise in anxiety and fear, which is normal, you know. But when you get a shift like that, that just like if all, our, all of our blood pressures went up by five, five, five uh, millimetres, that, that increases the risk of, um, of uh, various cardiovascular problems at the, other end of the, at, the end, at the other end of the spectrum. So the same thing is likely to happen in terms of mental health, that it will push a lot of the people in the risk zone over the edge. So we are concerned about that. And we've also got to manage the, the, the anxiety and fear in the short term. And the government's package yesterday um, was very much targeted at that. And um, just want to say the, the sector and I personally welcome it very, very warmly and appreciate very much the effort and focus that both the Prime Minister and um, Mr Hunt have put into this issue. They're the only government in the world that I'm aware of that have actually focused on mental health at this stage of the crisis, even though every country will confront a major problem further down the track of um, a rising tide of mental Ill health following, following the problem. It's a multi-million dollar package. How far will it go? Um, well, actually, as I say, it seems to be targeted in two, two different areas. One is a prevention sort of focus, trying to absorb some of this anxiety, trying to provide information and crisis lines are being supported and so on, um, Lifeline, Kids Healthline, Beyond Blue, those sorts of things. And um, domestic violence is worrying the government, so that's a consequence of the um, kind of uh, forced isolation that we're experiencing, I think. So it's kind of well targeted that way. There's a lot more value in it, though, as you've just heard from Sophie. The telehealth issue is, is, is probably m more important for mental health than any other area of, of the health system. It's something that you can actually translate quite quickly in, into into, into uh, um, uh, the front line because you don't need to take temperatures, you don't need to take blood pressures and so on. So, so we can actually do a lot of that work, particularly for stable patients who, who uh, already have a relationship with, with, um, with a clinician. So I think that's, that's, that's a very, very good, agile move by, by Minister Hunt and we really appreciate it. Um, there will be another subgroup of patients who still need face-to-face, -face, though, that they're patients with more acute and complex problems, and we really need to think about how to look after them, because as you, as you said yourself a minute ago, we don't necessarily want them coming into crowded waiting rooms in mental health centres. So I think we've got to sort of flip that too and start going out to them as mental health workers into their homes, and that reduces risks for everybody concerned, I think. So uh, there's, there's another wave of reform required. Um, um, we've got time to plan for that and, and, uh, and, and, and design that and then roll it out. Financially, a lot of, lot of this is actually cost neutral because um, the telehealth is just doing things that we probably would have been do, uh, doing anyway in, in a more face-to-face -face mode. Uh, we talk a lot about physical distancing and social isolation these days in the context of coronavirus. What impact do you think that is having on the way people are presenting in terms of uh, mental health issues down the track and what can we do to, to mitigate that? 
Well, I, I think people are already str many people are already struggling with this. Um, it's obviously necessary, and I'll, we just want to reinforce what the prime minister said last night that you know this is absolutely vital that people do follow these instructions and rules. Um, however, this is not a normal way to live, and it cuts us off from a lot of the connections that we have, which make life worth living and, and keep us mentally healthy. You know, social connections, leisure, sport, all, all the sort of things that we are losing temporarily are going to affect our mental health. So. We do need to think about compensations or comp compensatory mechanisms for this. Fortunately, we do have, you know, technology and media um, as no previous generation had before us has actually had. So, so there are ways we can work around it, work around the virus, if you want to put it that way. So, and that is actually happening, and, and especially young people are very uh, um, adept at that. Um, but you know, young people of all groups need social connections. So, I think um, we we really need to to uh, be prepared for the, the medium to long-term effects of that. But we do have time to, to now plan. And the, I know that the government and the health department and Minister Hunter are giving some thought as to the next phase of our mental health response. And we obviously, obviously stand ready to support them and really appreciate everything that they're doing. Patrick McGorry, always good to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. All the best. And if you or anyone you know needs information or support, you can contact Beyond Blue on 1300 22 4636. Or if you or someone you know is experiencing distress, please contact Lifeline on 131114. The states and territories will move to put a temporary ban on evictions from rental properties for people who are facing financial distress. Measures to address rental stress for both businesses and residents across the country have been considered by the National Cabinet. Our business reporter Dan Ziffer joins us now from Melbourne. Dan, what's been announced? Well, some really substantial answers to the question that I think for millions of Australians has been keeping them up at night. Essentially, we have a six-month moratorium on evictions. So if you can't pay, you can still stay. There's a lot more detail being released on commercial tenancies, so people who own shops or businesses, than there has been for the 8 million Australians who live in 3 million different rental properties. So we're still waiting clarity, but at least what we've done from the National Cabinet this time is essentially we've bought everyone six months breathing room. So there'll be no evictions for a six month period, and that links up with what the big four banks have offered for mortgages to essentially put a pause on them for the same amount of time. So what we're going to do in that six month period, there's many questions still remaining, but we've got the time now to try and work out between renters, landlords and the whole chain involved in rental, how to work out a soft landing. Uh, Dan, for those people who don't have time for a soft landing, they, they, they're sort of feeling the hardship more immediately, what should they do? It's still really unknown. It's very unclear. Uh, essentially, people won't be evicted if they don't pay the rent, but there are still lots of questions around what that means in six months' time. Uh, you know, landlords need to make money because they are servicing mortgages and paying charges. Uh, renters need to stay where they are to isolate where they are, and they can. But we're still waiting on a lot more clarity. This is a start, and we've heard a lot more detail on commercial tenancies, where commercial tenants will be able to break leases, be able to renegotiate them. But at this stage, all the Prime Minister has said is that renters should have a chat to their landlord. And that doesn't really work. You know, in commercial tenancy, that works because you can be someone like Solomon Liu, who has 900 shops, and the conversation that you have with your landlord is very different to if you're in a share house or you, you know, live in a house or apartment and your landlord has maybe one or two properties. So there's a long way to go. But what has been announced, a six-month stay on evictions, essentially buys everyone in the system time to try and work out what to do next. Dan, what about the banks? Are they coming to the party as well in terms of these, these, these holidays for the time being? They certainly have. Australia's big four banks, Commonwealth, Westpac, ANZ and NAB, have essentially said to people who have mortgages, you can put a pause on your payments. Now, come back in three months, we'll see how you're doing, and then if needs be, you can pause for another three months. You know, at this stage, that's the period of time people are looking at with regards to this crisis. It could be longer. 
Uh, we've, the government has spoken about essentially putting parts of the economy into hibernation. And what they're doing by stopping evictions and by giving people the ability to pause their mortgage is they're kind of pressing pause on the rental system for six months. It doesn't answer all the problems. There are still going to be a lot that needs to be worked out, particularly for people who rent their homes. But this does provide people some security, people who have no income, that at least for the next six months, if they have a roof over their head now, they can keep it. Dan Ziffer joining us from Melbourne. Dan, thank you so much. And the ABC does have a web stream dedicated to coronavirus coverage. You can find it at abc.net.au slash coronavirus. Let's take some time to check the weather now with Nate Byrne. We're finally getting some backup rain in the east of the country after some really decent falls a couple of weeks ago. Today, another 10, 15, perhaps 20 millimetres on for some parts of New South Wales, all thanks to this band of cloud that extends all the way back into Western Australia along some troughs. Unfortunately, not much rainfall at all further west. The focus really is all on New South Wales today. A little bit of wet weather, though, continues for some parts of the southeast with onshore winds and along the east coast of Queensland as well. The odd storm continuing in the north too, but even the tropics have pretty much calmed down at the moment. Unfortunately, this rainfall is going to clear out fairly quickly from the east. But some good news, some rainfall developing in the southeast of WA thanks to an upper level disturbance will start making its way eastwards and that's bringing the promise of even more backup rain for the east of the country towards the end of the week. In fact, we might see another 50 millimetres for some. Let's see what's happening with the capitals for your Tuesday, though. It's only a possible shower or storm for Brisbane, a top of 30 degrees. And then after that, it's going to be dry. Partly cloudy in Sydney, 25, 24 for Canberra with some early fog but a dry day. Mostly sunny and 22 on the way for Melbourne. Hobart expecting 21 degrees, 23 for Adelaide, 27 for Perth and Darwin staying dry as well. It's getting to 34. Nate, thank you. You're watching ABC News. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Coming up on the News Channel, we'll get an update on the coronavirus outbreak in the Northern Territory with the Chief Minister, Michael Gunner, expected to step up any time now. So stay with us for that. We'll be back with you in just a moment.